Um, okay. Um, good evening and welcome. <laughs> All right. So, a um, couple of things first. So, Matthew Cuthbertson is my name. I will be uh, guiding you through the next hour or so. So, um, welcome to uh, Etsy. Welcome to our new fellows showcase for 2023. Um, and we'll begin the meeting uh, as always with academy meetings uh, with uh, the acknowledgement of the country. So we used to uh, pay our respects to the traditional custodians uh, of the land on which we are meeting today. Uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nations uh, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm not sure about emerging, but our new fellows, I guess they've already emerged. <laughs> but, uh, but the purpose of a event like tonight, I think this is quite a special occasion for us to, to welcome and congratulate our new fellows, uh, and also just to get to know them a bit better and to get to know a bit more about their work. So we had five new Victorian fellows this uh, year. You heard from uh, Senator Kim Carr at our last meeting. Unfortunately, we have an apology tonight, so uh, it's not false advertising. Uh, Professor Ann Nicholson was unfortunately has called in sick at three o'clock this afternoon uh, and unfortunately was an apology for this evening. So, uh, but we have we still have two very distinguished speakers for you uh, with some terrific things uh, to talk to you about. So uh, I shall not take up any more of your time. I shall uh, hand over now to our first speaker and that is Professor Taz uh, Neuromathis. Now, and I'll call him Taz for short. Uh, Taz, and I think all of the speakers we had tonight were uh, interesting examples who built, built very successful careers in sort of large and complex organizations. But they've learned uh, a few things about survival, I suppose. Um, but they've also worked uh, and been very successful in building research careers through a period of a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty and, uh, and difficulty on occasion. So uh, when I look at Taz's background, uh, I guess back in the day, he was a uh, director of part of the Photonics CRC. He was uh, group manager for network systems in, for NICTA. And I also noticed that he was uh, very prominent in setting up the um, uh, the Melbourne Accelerator Program, MAP, so uh, Accelerator for uh, Young Entrepreneurs in the University. So he did that, and then later on, he's now Director of the Network uh, Society Institute at the University of Melbourne. And in his spare time, he's Chair of the Photonic Society of Future Technologies Task Force. So I think there's, there's a lot in Taz's background that tells you about uh, his passion for collaboration and, uh, and impact in his research. So currently, uh, he's the research dean within the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. Um, he's also a director of the Oceana Cybersecurity Centre, and his research interests, there are lots of them, microwave photonics, uh, broadband networks, edge computing, scalability of telecom and internet services. So I think he can find a few things to talk about in that mixture. So his title for this evening is The Evolution of Optical Wireless Com uh, Communications and Computing. Please, Taz. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to give these. And I wasn't sure how to pitch it, but it might be very light on the technology, but I will just walk you through where I've been and um, what type of things interest me. So the kind of rough outline is here in terms of, I'll kind of start with the, my story, I guess. It might be slightly different to the usual ones that you probably see. Um, and it might have some relationship to the resilience that uh, um, Matthew mentioned, but I think I leave you to reflect on that. But um, then I'll just give you an idea of what's kind of my competency on which my research is based and then probably dive into one example where I, I kind of do it just to give you a taste of my research. But, and I've been given an instruction to throw some ideas for you to be get excited. So I've kind of touched on a little bit on my takings of the 
the major reform that higher education, the politicians are quite excited about it and why we should be excited and try to fix it. Uh, maybe I'll leave some thoughts on that. Uh, I'm probably interested in your reaction to that as well. So uh, I grew up in a very small town where, uh, along a main highway in Sri Lanka that connects northern tip to the southern. And in year six, you know, about 16 to probably 20 years old, I was living in among a, a situation where civil war was just building up. Every time where a youngster goes around is seen as either a potential target for a recruit as a militia or a suspect as a, as a terrorist bomber. So probably before I hit 20, I can remember vividly probably about six times, I felt the gun barrels in my back of my head. So luckily that they were just bluffs. So I managed to escape <laughs> and nothing really changed it. But I, I kind of always grew up in a time when everyone saw me as a suspect. So it was kind of changed and I had to prove something that I, I will, I'm not a suspect and I, I'm, I can think and I can act. So I've then, my family was quite, as a, in a, in a sort of academy like here, I grew up among engineers. So I was always very clear that I want to be an engineer. And, but I grew up among civil engineers. So I was definitely uh, sure that I'm not going to be one who's a civil engineer. <laughs> and so, uh, and family was, uh, you know, can see that what's happening around my me. They kind of snatched me from North and send me to South to do the, um, my year 12 exams. I just went through, they thought I'm going to not make it through year 12. And they were quite surprised. I was ranked pretty high in the island, you know, around top 10 to enter into engineering. I, I entered Sri Lankan University as a young, one of the youngest, but then three years, 33 times the university opened and closed, but I couldn't move beyond, I, I never saw the first year exam. And then the South was got into an issue with socialist uprising. And so the Northern was civil war and South where I was kind of trying to see where I can finish my university studies. And there was a socialist uprising, which actually meant that universities became the camps of socialist rebels. So then I had to kind of eventually decided that I'm fleeing here to pursue. So. During that time, I wasn't wasting time. I was actually studying management accounting. And, and you might feel that why it's actually good for me now, because I almost became a management accountant before I landed in Australia as a humanitarian uh, person seeking asylum here. So Australia was a kind of special country. That made the possibility of me, you know, moving from Jaffna to Albert. Sorry. Really, so leaving one of the top university and then um, coming here and then the university was really, you know, welcoming me into basically told me that I can do anything at Melbourne if I wanted to do medicine, but as I said, remember, I wanted to do um, engineering. So I went and then Swinburne offered me, I, because of my management accounting qualifications, they said, you can get one year off if you decide to do production engineering, but I always wanted to do electronic engineering. So I, I said, one year doesn't matter. So I will come to Melbourne and then continue. So I went through and then, you know, at the time there was quite a lot of things happening back. So that kind of towards the, I was going very well in undergrad, but the final year wasn't that great because I kind of was a little bit distracted from what's happening back home and my grades were slipping a little bit. So I wasn't sure whether I was gonna get PhDs. I was kind of applying for positions. I was getting offers in industry and suddenly my PhD scholarship came. So I made a U-turn not to go to industry because I was always had some inclination for uh, uh, academia. And so took the opportunity to take PhD. Even when the PhD, I was thinking, is it microwave or is it photonic? So I had interest in both during my undergrad final years. I was offered to a PhD scholarship in UWA to go into astronomy and then design uh, the probes for uh, deep space exploration. Or Otoka offered me a photonic scholarship in Melbourne to do uh, uh, optical communications. 
So finally decided to stay in Melbourne and then pursue that so the finish PhD. Then, you know, so maybe there was a very competitive environment in Australia. So I wasn't sure whether I will have a career and I, I'm not sure whether I will get a postdoc. The few mentors were good enough for me to offer a Japan science, you know, uh, science fellowship to go and do a postdoc in Japan. By the time I was getting ready, then Dalma and Rod told me that there is a postdoc at Photonic CRC. You want to be interested or you want to go to Japan. So I took the offer again, made a U-turn and stayed back in Melbourne. Then I was going through the, the kind of postdoc and then 2000 was the growth of the fiber optic communications. If you can spell photonics, you get a job in you. <laughs> uh, and um, so I thought, oh, why, why not? You know, the, the, my, our lab was 20 researchers, pretty much over six months became 10 because we were the only place in, in the world we had a university lab who was building systems of fiber optic communications. Rod was leading that group. And everyone else was doing device research, but we were the one building networks and systems. There was a lot of startup companies who were popping up left, right, center, want to build, get into the fiber optics market. So our lab guys were targeted, you know, you come in, come in. So I had the opportunity to go to US and be a co-founder of a submarine turnkey um, cable company. And I had the interview and then took the family there to show. I had already had two um, young kids. And uh, again, when I come back, Rod heard that I had the interview and he kind of asked me, I heard, I, I read it on the grapevine that you've been pet hunted. But so I, I said, yeah, it was just purely an exploration, Rod. So I just went, I didn't, I haven't made a mind that. I, he asked me what would make you stay back with us uh, to really maintain the lab and rebuild the group. And I said, I always wanted to be in academia. So if you give me an academic position, I will stay back. So that, again, another, another U-turn. And I just gave up the chance to be the entrepreneur and the co-founder of a leading startup and then decided to took up my kind of long-term passion of staying in the academia. So that kind of landed me back in the university. The Photonic CRC was a great way for me to stay in academia, but kind of do things with Telstra and other things. And you know, it's really yeah, throw me in the deep end. Rod really kind of gave me say, you know, you're going to run this. I was just a senior lecturer. Everyone else was, you know, leading professors in the country. And I was kind of trying to fight for the university, a fair share of the budget from, you know, as you many of you have been in this position and you can see how the power play plays it. But that really taught me because of the Things that I grew up with gave me a little bit of things. Doesn't matter who you are, as long as you have a view and you have an argument, I think you can put forward. So I think that gave me a, a courage to kind of maintain an own director. I think we maintained the CRC over that time. And then the NICTA formed, I was asked to take up a pro, uh, the program manager. Again, it was an interesting kind of national initiative. And I had a two major programs, and then one of the program pushed into a startup. And we thought we had the artificial intelligence approach and a photonics approach. We combined this was before the neuro, you know, people were talking about AI. And we can actually sense any pulse going through fiber optic networks, and we can tell the companies what's wrong with the uh, transmission without opening up the packet. That's the technology we have. So we thought, yes, that's what where the telecom is going. Uh, everything is going into optical. So we need to sense what's happening to every information. And we've got a technology, which is kind of an interdisciplinary approach, uh, a, a very far, a very simple me me metrology combined with AI, we can we, we will figure out everything. And so the many my team was very keen to go. So I said, yes, go ahead. And, and help them to have a backup in terms of R&D contract with NICTA to support them and then go out, suddenly the industry changed. Um, we, we have massive growth in DSP. We don't need to open up information between endpoint, but we can pre-program the pulses and we can detect it and then compensate any problem that happened. So there's no need to really look into the light traversing through the fiber optic network. So, you know, things like that kind of changed how the technology evolved. And, you know, while you do uh, research, uh, there are many opportunities come up, but sometimes we, we cannot really push that. And so there's always something in me was telling me that 
I need to be kind of trying to set up a system in Australia that actually makes it easier for people to start up. And so I kind of was working with Berkeley on this is the time when the, 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 the field was moving from entrepreneurship is a trait that we born with to entrepreneurship can be taught like many other things. People can be given a mindset training that will actually change people to take risk or calculated risk and go to the startup journey. And so Berkeley was trying to set up an accelerator and we tried to convince um, our local leadership to start something similar to that. It took me about 12 to 18 months to convince and only a few hundred K to get started. And as you can see, sometime in a big organization, leading change is actually difficult. And really taught me how you need to be, you know, at it in order to convince your colleagues to do it. And I think there may be a few of my ex mentors here listening on the uh, things who actually helped me to get to that point. And um, then we went through a number of things. So that just gives you a little bit of my personal story. So I spent probably more time than I was expecting. Uh, and as you know, the research is a team sport. And I actually, if you look through my papers, it would be very difficult to find unless it is my opinion or it is a point of view that I have shared online. Uh, most of it will be a team publication. And uh, this for uh, the list has people who made a big difference to my early years, but also have uh, long collaboration, collaborations. And there are many PhD students who have actually made it possible to do that research. And I was fortunate because of those situations I was thrown into either changing or rebuilding group. I had the opportunity to have a large number of PhDs. So that actually led to a big step change in my outputs. But it's not just because you know, I was any, any different to many other academics, just I was in a situation where I could have access to a large number of talent and then that led to a lot of outputs. So who am I in terms of my research interests? I work in an area called microwave photonics or nowadays called RF photonics. If you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the microwave covers around wavelength around these and the light waves go from far infrared to ultraviolet around here. And there is a gap in the middle called terahertz gap and now it's becoming interesting area for us to build systems. And so my field is essentially in a kind of combining the microwave or radio frequency electronics with photonics. That's kind of my core competencies. So what we do is we use that to construct interesting devices, interesting subsystems, interesting networks of doing it. You might wonder where this actually gets. If you open a radar, this is how we do it because we can't process very high frequency signals too, low, you know, uh, too much in the distance. So we have to convert them into optically transmit and then process it. And if you take a 5G network, then it is using these in order to support your network connections. So essentially, you know, a lot of our research is about getting microwave or radio frequency signals of uh, varying frequency and taking it through electro-optic conversion so that now we can then route this signal over a large network and then at the end to convert it back to get the signal and then process it. So a lot of our earlier work is about design and optimizing these type of uh, uh, transmission links, which actually helps you to you know, connect the base station to a network end or from a radar to a processing end or a you know, radio astronomy disk and into a processing end or a satellite bound antenna into internal processing end. Exactly the same kind of link. The idea is to remote the processing end from the point of where you're collecting the microwave signal so you can distribute uh, over long distance using very low loss uh, optical fiber transmissions. But when you distribute this very high frequency content in the optical domain, not everything is easy as like internet optical fiber connections. There are lots of problems in converting from signal to, you know, from electrical radio frequency signal to optical domain. 
And there are issues in taking that signal over the fiber because of the fiber properties interacting with it. And similarly on the other end. So it kind of makes it very interesting to look at that interaction between microwaves and light waves and try and improve uh, devices, improve the links, improve the network of these links uh, and achieve that. So the idea is that if you can now just, uh, you know, create a separation of where the input is collected, this may be a range of antenna in a radar and then put it through fiber. Now you can network them through a complex network and then deliver to the other end. This can be uh, tens of kilometers and in some cases even greater. And, but what it is, is once you convert into optical domain, there are many signal processing things that can be done. It's very difficult to do in electronics can now be done directly at the optical level. So that gave us to look into what kind of uh, uh, processing that we can do in this space in order to achieve this one. So it could be, we can change the frequency, we can amplify or we can filter. That is very hard to do in electronic, but we can do it in optical domain uh, and, and so on. And we can even use this as a memory to delay the waveform so that processors can be ready to do the processor. So we can introduce delay, we can modify the phase of the signal and we can and we can listen to particular directions by doing that, or we can send signal in a particular way uh, and so on. We, there are lots of uh, opportunity to manipulate that directly in the photonic domain. So taking this part recently as the, the, the artificial intelligence or neural networks, you know, there is a domain of computing it is known as reservoir computing. The idea is this, if you get a lots of inputs, if you have a way of transforming those inputs into a nonlinear transformation, that kind of gives you the kind of neurons. And, and then you can wire up individual neurons towards an output and you can actually get lots of processing done on the input and you can improve certain uh, detection or processing of this input by doing this. Why we are interested in the photonic domain is these can be hundreds of gigabit per second speeds coming in light. If I can do this in the light, I can do simple operations, but very fast in the optical domain. And, and then this can be very simple algorithm. It could be just simply sum of a couple of neuronal output. And that basically means I can do this computing at almost at the same rate as the input signals coming at, which is very uh, high frequency or high speed signal. So it's now recently it has become an important during the COVID, you know, we, we put a call to the DSD and then they, you know, they were quite interested in at just throwing out with this. So within a, over a you know, 12 month, we were able to demonstrate a complex waveform from RF coming from uh, a source uh, with a lot of impairments in there we need to go and look into that signal and improve the detection. We were able to use this uh, simple setup to improve that. You might wonder how this comes to this. What happens is we do in take the input signal, we do it in a way that there are multiple uh, copies of given input into different amplitude levels, that's called electrical masking. And we throw that into a device which is, has inherent nonlinearity. What it does is it generates all these different transformed input state. And then what we do is we, it is coming in a time, timed manner. We let it circulate it over the fiber, fiber. So what it does is all these neurons, which are kind of mesh connectivity here, but they are actually circulating in a time synchronous manner, one after the other. So by simply passing them through a digital register, I can just pick up whichever neuron I want and then basically wire up the connection towards a summing device. And then there is now a simple, very fast prediction algorithm is operating directly at the optical level to give us insight what happens. So if it is a submarine cable coming in with gigabits of data coming in, if someone is being tampering with, I can then kind of in flight estimate whether this has been tampered with or not. Or if there is a radar, which is having about 30 gigahertz of bandwidth coming at you, I can, can pinpoint and see whether what signal I wanted to exploit 
then I can do this algorithm here. And you can see this is very kind of simple, but it, it is kind of doing an analog computing on neurons rather than a digital neural network type of computing. It is not very complex. It cannot be used for complex problem, but it can be used for very fast, simple kind of problems. So with that, you know, we've been kind of, that's kind of roughly gives you a, a kind of context where the community, how is it doing one minute here, sorry. So, you know, we've, we've been proposing what is the, the next version of 6G is going to be. And we've been working on optical wireless network as a, as a proposal to do that. So what, how does it work is, is the fiber comes to your uh, premises, there is an access point here, and this is no longer wireless, it's all used using light. And what we can do is we can set up a cone of light that can be steered to a user, and each cone of light can operate at 10 gigabit per second. And I can set multiple wavelengths, so I can give you several tens of gigabits connectivity that way. There is no other solution that can actually give you that level of connectivity. So we've been over the last a uh, few years, we've been systematically looking at what is needed in order to realize this vision. And, and that's where we've been going in that context. So I might just skip through this and then I, I'm, I'm quite happy, happy to come back what we have done. So we've kind of worked through that uh, to give you. I just want to leave you with this, um, this point. It's an, you know, there is a lot of motherhood statements in the um, the higher education reform and uh, 2035 is the path government to do it. What we need is over the time, the in Australia, the successive governments have tinkered with universities. And, and I think that what it is that their court interim report comes out with certain <laughs> principles, it would be nice to have really broad support for those things. What I see important is, it is that research training should be at the center of our research capacity building. And what is lacking here is that, that the, even though Australia is producing large number of PhDs in line with many other countries, many of our PhDs don't come from domestic uh, uh, intake. They are come, they, 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 that, that there's nothing wrong. There are many people around the world wants to come and access, you know, world's, you know, top 10 ranked academic institutions to do that training. But that is not valued by our industry. Industry doesn't value our PhD training. Industry doesn't take our PhDs and then give them the careers that they need. And many of our PhDs succeed in industry almost kind of accidentally because they have that massive skill set to be able to do it. It would be really important to kind of bring that commitment to really attract our local talent into PhD. There are many empirical studies have shown the companies with PhD qualifications do really stand very tall on the innovation capacity. The, the company executives with PhD qualifications, they actually lead the company with very strong collaboration with academic research institutions. In, if you look at the competitiveness index, Australia ranks around 30. Uh, main attributing factor, if you see it, it is a university industry collaboration. Yet, as a country, we don't monitor that, we don't measure it longitudinally, whether government policies are improving upward movement. And there's an opportunity seems to be in order to do focus on that. So I really encourage you to have a look and, and now the time to put some comments so that we can actually get the right settings in the higher education. So I'll leave it there. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Taz. That's an inspiring journey. You learned how to spell photonics along the way, I guess, by the sound of the way. Um, so we have a, a few moments for a comment or question for Taz. Anything about uh, research training and higher education yet? Uh, get anyone's attention? Any comments? Callum. So, um, Taz, one of, the, one of the things I've experienced is, well, first of all, a lot of Australian industry is SMEs. So they don't have a lot of innovative capacity necessarily themselves. And, and when it comes to a choice of do I hire a bachelor of engineers or do I hire a PhD graduate in engineering, frequently it comes down to cost rather than value. Um, so And that's because they're SMEs and they're cost-driven rather than value 
value driven, but uh, it's a gross statement. But for a, um, if I can sort of average it out like that. So I think one of the things we have to do is increase the absorptive capacity of Australian industry so they recognise the value of PhDs. And it's almost like a chicken and egg. You need exactly. more PhDs going in there to increase the absorptive capacity, but in order to get more going in there, they've got to recognise the value of the PhD. So the, the proposal is actually currently looking at, actually includes includes the potential to provide that capacity, absorptive capacity by tax offset of PhDs, training and so on. So it's actually possible for, a, they actually not hire when they have got a PhD, they can engage with university while they're training, while they're being embedded in industry. And those kind of changes might actually lead to uh, SMEs having it. But in fact, in my le lesson so far, some of the SMEs are very eager and they realize, realize given that they don't have the capacity, they're willing to come and work with us for that capacity and see universities as extension of the innovation benches to do that. Mm -hmm. But very some big companies have very sensitive to cost and as a result, shy away from making commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, this is purely from you know, a few anecdotes in terms of working with some SMEs and startups. And <clears throat> they quite keen to work with you. They recognize what they don't have. But many companies think they can buy talent when they need it. As a result, do not invest. No, it's sorry. Helen demanded a right of response. So, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Just a quick question, and that is really about the value of internships. You know, I mean, the Academy has an internship program. Um, you know, AMSI had an internship program. You know, there, there are a number of internship programs around working with industry. And a lot of them uh, involve PhDs while they're still doing their PhDs. How, how valuable is that? And is this something that we need to be promoting um, even more? Absolutely. I think we, we, we just need to scale up that. Activity and I'm fantastic. See, and I've had a few of my students go on to internship, and I can see what the difference it makes. Uh, and also, they've actually made a way to do that connection so that they can choose industry careers as well. And uh, absolutely, and there is a now the government recognized, and there is a government support for that internship as well. What we need is a rise in the scale of industry willing to take them in. And so we, you know, we also universities need to move to create the internal systems to help them get connected. Anyone else? Helen, uh, you, you, we're going to need no one else. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me the microphone. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, the, the other thing you hear, which, which uh, 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 really annoys me when I hear it is that Australia produces too many PhDs. And, and I think it comes from people thinking that the only destination for PhDs is academia. And I know in my own um, institution, for example, 80% of our PhDs don't go into academia, they go into industry and government. Yeah. And, and um, so I guess it's more a comment than a question, but I think, and maybe the accord can be part of the process. We're gonna change the dialogue. And when we hear those, I think ill-informed comments. We've yeah. just got to knock them on the head. Exactly. I think the 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 I think the Mathematic Institute had a paper probably a few years back, and that kind of did. But I, I do remember seeing a conversation article, kind of exactly the title. It really irritated me because that's not the reality. I think it is really, um, as you said, maybe you know, in some countries it's about only thirty percent in academia. In Australia, probably less than that. Yeah. I think we had one more comment at the back. You don't get a right of reply though this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's maybe less of an issue in engineering than it is in the science faculties, but within the universities, uh, now, for example, I was having a conversation with a student that I'm mentoring just today, and he was asking me about opportunities in a in a in a non-academic environment. So this is a PhD student and uh, there's a within the university. There's a real ethos that the pinnacle is acad is academia, and in many respects, I think you know, we've got to work to you know, talk to the students and end with the academics. 
that there are incredible opportunities you know, within industry, within research agencies and the like that you know, aren't just academics. Absolutely. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, for, thank you very much for the comment. Now, so uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, we'll, uh, so we'll move on to our second speaker, and that's Dr. Beth uh, Ebert. So Beth is Senior Principal Research Scientist uh, at the Bureau of Meteorology, and she has another role, which is Team Leader Forecast Quality. Now, I read that title, I thought that is a really scary job to have. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you will, you will hear what that's uh, all about. So Beth's got a long, uh, a long career in sort of forecast verification and evaluation, and she has led a number of sort of significant international projects in that area. Uh, she had a joint working group on forecast verification with the World Meteorological Organization, uh, and she's now got another significant project on evaluating sort of end-to-end -end value chain on, uh, on forecasting and response. So that's Beth's thing, working at the nexus of, of weather and health. And in, in 2017, she was part of this team that developed the early warning system for thunderstorm for, for how to stop the sign falling on you. <laughs> uh, I think the universe it, telling you something. Matthew. Indeed, it is. Indeed. <laughs> maybe the so, God. I think we. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's a, a premonition or something as well. I think we all remember that amazing asthma day in uh, Victoria. So Beth is going to tell you about that. And just one thing I did notice, speaking of PhDs, that uh, Beth did her PhD in uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I looked them up and I noticed that there were 19 Nobel Prize winners came from that university. So Beth, no pressure. <laughs> but we're very glad you came to Australia and we're very glad to have you. So let's hear you talk about a warning for epidemic thunderstorm asthma in Victoria. Thank you, Matthew. And I'm very happy and honored to be here. And I'm so pleased that so many of my mentors over the years um, from the Bureau of Meteorology and my, my career in meteorology have come today. So um, thank you for coming and thank you for inviting me. So um, I will talk about the thunderstorm asthma work that we've been doing on the book. Before I do that, I'll just say a little bit about myself. You can probably hear from my accent that I didn't grow up in this country. I am from California. Um, where my parents were both physicists, so it was maybe ordained that I would go into science. Um, I went into meteorology, but it could have just as easily been geology or oceanography. Something about the planet um, was just really, really interesting. And so I, um, I did my study in meteorology, and not even physics, not even maths, but just straight meteorology. Got my PhD at Wisconsin, and then was thinking, well, what should I do? Um, I decided that academics was maybe a bit of a pressure cooker. The divorce rate amongst my professors was about 50%. <laughs> and um, decided, mm, don't need to put myself in that pressure cooker. Um, and I really like doing the kind of work that um, is useful. You know, I remember a, a meteorologist when I was new, one of the new scientists at the Bureau, his name was Bruce Brooks, and he was in South Australia. And I was working on satellite cloud detection for airports so that you could tell if there were low clouds and didn't want to crash the planes. And he, he would call me up and ask different questions about it. And he'd always finish, he'd say, that's so useful. I'm so glad you're doing this. And I just thought, this is why, this is why I chose this. So um, I've been interested in applications, applied science, really pretty much my whole career. So landed in meteorology and um, I really haven't looked back. It's been a great place to work. So what I'd like to talk about today, um, there's not a great deal of science in what I'm going to tell you um, today, but that's probably fine. Um, but yeah, who, who can remember being in this thunderstorm asthma event in 2016? So yeah, a few, a few people weren't in the country, but it was, it was a pretty big deal. Um, so, you know, people were leaving work in the afternoon. Um, it was windy, it was hot, and it was the first really hot windy day we'd had in November. And um, and people just stopped, you know, started experiencing breathing problems all over the place. Um, 
So this is a picture of radar imagery plotted. You can tell this is the map of Melbourne. There's Port Phillip Bay. And this is a, a thunderstorm squall line that's marching across this imagery every six minutes um, from the Bureau's radar. And the, um, the black line is what we call the gust front. So the leading edge of the thunderstorm where the, the cold air pools out and it's a bit of a boundary and kicks up a lot of turbulence. Um, the, the radar is, is measuring um, real reflectivity, but you can sort of think of it as, as rain rate, as a conversions. But what's really important are these asterisks that are popping up shortly after this thing moves past. And, um, and those are calls for ambulances. And the, the time, um, you know, it was 20 minutes the ambulances started getting calls for people who were really, really ill on that event. Um, this is a you know, one of many articles that was in, in the papers and the media uh, talking about the numbers of people that went to the hospital. So almost 10,000 people over 30 hours um, were in Melbourne hospital, visiting Melbourne hospitals. They didn't necessarily stay, but they were coming with breathing um, difficulties. We don't have the numbers for how many people went to the GPs or the pharmacies and so on, but um, it was like a bomb had struck, really. Nobody knew what was really what was going on but all these people were sick all of a sudden and the, the call on the ambulance was overwhelming. And so ultimately 10 people died from this event. And a few of those people that passed away were waiting for the ambulance and the ambulance couldn't get there or it was queued up at the hospital and so on. So it was, it was a unprecedented event, unprecedented health event. Um, and so as part of the uh, response to that, so there was was kicked off some of the science and service development, which I'll talk about. Um, so let's let's talk about the phenomenon first a little bit. What do we understand about it? Um, we don't understand it very well still, but this is a conceptual diagram of how we think it works. Um, we're still trying to really understand the mechanism. So if we have our thunderstorm, which is the gray blob and the, the gust front that I mentioned is that what we call the convergence line because the air is moving and it's converging with, with its environment. And so there's um, often a lot of, of turbulence that happens there. If we think of the yellow as pollen near the ground, you can imagine that out in the, in the gust front of that convergence line, it's being sort of compressed and, and in, you know, intensified in terms of its concentration. So we need an allergenic material. We believe in our um, case that it was ryegrass pollen that was the major culprit, but we don't know for sure that there weren't fungi and other things in the air which could have contributed to people also getting sick. Um, the gust front is the mechanism for concentrating it in the air. The really mysterious bit is it somehow breaks up. A pollen grain is about 70 millimeters and it's, it gets stuck in your throat or your nose but usually wouldn't go into your lungs, but something was causing it to break into tiny little fragments and that you could breathe into your lungs. And that's what, if you were allergic um, to, the, to the allergens in the raw grass, that was what was making people really sick. Um, and we there have been all kinds of um, proposed mechanisms for how it could rupture. Um, it could be due to lightning, it could be due to osmotic shock where the pollen grain gets wet and swells and pops essentially. Um, it could be due to mechanical breakup with, with wind knocking it around. We just, we don't really know. And maybe all of those things are relevant. It could be. So we're still looking for that smoking gun. And then, of course, um, the exposure of vulnerable people. And because it was moving through at, you know, a time when a lot of people were leaving the work, getting on their bikes, you know, walking to the train station, whatever, there were a lot of people exposed. So the uh, Department of Health in Victoria was very keen to not be surprised by another event like this. And so there was um, a investigations very quickly done through the uh, Inspector General's office and a recommendation made um, to develop an early warning system for thunderstorm asthma. And not so much for individuals, but for the health system epidemics. So they wanted, they wanted to be able to know in advance to get the ambulance ready, to get the hospitals ready to take people and so on, so that they would be better prepared next time. So in this photo, um, there's people from the Bureau of Meteorology. Some of you will know some of those folks. Um, people from the health department. In fact, the lady in the corner, um, Claire, 
Mukher is the new um, acting chief health officer in Victoria. So she was involved in that, and Danny Sutoris, who's um, the medical um, consultant to the health department. And we needed to get something in place in time for the next pollen season, which was the start of October. So by the, by the time we started this, we had about seven months to put something in place. So it wasn't going to be anything fancy. There was no time for fancy. But what we did come up with was a, a pretty simple minded mechanism or matrix where on the bottom of the matrix um, is different pollen concentrations from low to high. These are in um, grains per cubic meter. And then chance of convergence lines, which we decided that the easiest way to get at that would be to take advantage of our severe thunderstorm forecasting service. And part of that severe thunderstorm forecast warning can be for um, damaging winds. And so the damaging winds are often due to the, the convergence line and the turbulence that's, that's caused by that and bringing down the winds from a higher altitude. So yeah, we had um, here was pretty much using the thunderstorm or warnings that were already being made and looking over, you know, what's the likelihood of the, of the winds being damaging. And then the pollen, well, where were we gonna get the pollen? That was a bit tricky. So a lot of the work that was done was um, a mad rush by our colleagues at the University of Melbourne, Ed Newbegin and Ed, Ed Lampioni, to get some pollen measuring equipment in place um, and to train up some people to count pollen. So this is a Burkhard spore trap. It's a mechanical vacuum cleaner. You put a sort of a sticky tape there and it sucks in the air and the stuff in the air sticks to the tape. Then you put a purple dye on it and you put it under your microscope and you count pollen grains in your sticky tape. And that's that's the best technology that existed at the time. They were starting to be automated pollen counters, but they weren't very good and they were very expensive. So we managed to source um, another five of these. There were only three in the state of Victoria. So we got another five and put them in different parts of Victoria. And then another part that was really critical was a statistical model, which was developed by a postdoc that was here at the University of Melbourne and using a long time series of pollen data that Melbourne had counted, um, weather data from the Bureau and some satellite data as well to, to say what was the state of the pasture land. So this is what was come up with in that short time. Um, it still looks like this today. Of course, you can get it on Big Emergency, the Big Emergency app. You can get it on the Melbourne Pollen app if you subscribe to that. Um, and it often is in the news if there's something that you need to know about. So it's, um, it's a district forecast. We have nine forecast districts in the state of Victoria. We're here in Central District. And if, if there's something to look at, um, you can, and click on it and it'll tell you a little bit. You can subscribe to this service if you want to get alerted, so which is which is really good. And the, the forecast goes for three days. So it's made in the morning for what for this afternoon, next day, and the following day. So how many people remember the thunderstorm asthma event of November 2020? Yeah, one. No, it was it wasn't so big. <laughs> but what was exciting about this one was well, we were prepared. So we could see the thunderstorms coming days out and um, Andrew in the audience would have been um, very familiar with this because I think he was in a, in a leadership role in that time. So yeah, okay. Next, yeah, anyway, it was, this, this, is, this is the, um, the product of having a warning service that hadn't existed in the past. And so we, there was all kinds of media, um, day, you know, a day in advance so that people could be prepared. And in particular, there was a lot of joined up um, communications from the health department, the media, the Bureau of Meteorology, the Ambulance Victoria, and we were all singing to the same song sheet. And so um, that had a, quite a positive um, impact. I think we, we won't be able to measure how many people didn't get sick because they stayed indoors, because they had their puffers, because they had their asthma medication, um, were taking it. But even in spite of that, it was one of the busiest um, days Ambulance Victoria had experienced. So it was, was good that we had this in place. And we're, we're convinced that it did make a difference. We just don't know how much, how big of a difference. Um, but one of the reasons, one of the things I'd like to emphasize here is the importance of communication. And that in our field um, of weather forecasting, 
a lot of the science we think about better, better observations and better models and, and so on, but a lot of the impact is due to better communication. You could have the best science in the world, but if the communication isn't being done effectively, you won't get the benefit. And so there's a lot of social science that goes on and is, is increasingly recognized in circles about to really do that end-to-end -end job of, um, of getting to the benefit, having really good communication and understanding how people behave, how people understand maps or not, how people interpret colors, all kinds of things. And so there was some science with this as well. And, and it was my pleasure to lead a multidisciplinary project with um, people from all of these organizations you can see on here. And the things that I've spoken out of already, the, you know, measuring the pollen, but looking from space to understand what is the, the grassland um, status, the, the growth phase. And in fact, if you can tell that the grass is blooming, then you know that you know it's time to watch out for pollen. If the grass is not blooming, you're not in danger yet. And that's usually in Victoria between about October and December. Um, and so part of that was having some um, time-lapse cameras on the ground photographing grass. You can watch the grass grow. I can show you a movie <laughs> of watching the grass grow, which was to ground truth what was going on in the satellite, which then could give us the big picture, right? And that was pretty interesting. And that was at University of Technology Sydney working on that. Pollen emission and dispersion modeling. This was a collaboration with CSIRO and with the university. And this is really how we thought we were going to do the forecasts. It ended up um, that machine learning did better than dispersion modeling, but this was our initial, initial thinking of how we would do it. Um, improving thunderstorm forecasting. We're you know, in, in the Bureau and our international colleagues working really hard to do a better job of modeling thunderstorms and getting to um, greater confidence in the fine details, but it's still really difficult. And it's, um, you know, a lot of the reason it's difficult to predict thunderstorm asthma is, is down to um, difficulties with knowing what the weather's going to do in any kind of detail. And then an awful lot of research going on on the health side as well. And we worked pretty closely with the health department to get epidemiological data, but there's parallel efforts going on to understand why people get sick, who gets sick, how long do, are they sick for, and, and things like that. So I wanted to just, um, what am I doing for time? Okay, I better, better hurry up. These are some of the science advances that have really taken place since the big event. Um, so you can categorize it in three sort of areas, measurement, prediction, and health. So automated pollen counting is getting better. And in fact, um, the department has just got a $2.4 million grant to put some automatic pollen monitors around Victoria, which is great news. Um, satellite sensing continues to improve. In situ measurement of pollen fragments in the air. This is, this is maybe gonna help us get to at what's causing the pollen to rupture. And uh, one of our colleagues in Iowa has got biofluorescence um, equipment that she brought to Melbourne to measure what was going on um, and, and getting a, a biological signal right there and then. And wouldn't that be amazing if we could have that kind of um, observations. In the prediction, um, I mentioned earlier that the machine learning is doing a really good job of the um, pollen prediction. One of the other things we found is that if we know what the humidity is going to be, that's another good predictor. So that matrix of the, the green, orange, and red, we can add another dimension of moisture and, and increase the accuracy of our predictions. Some really interesting syndromic surveillance work at the hospitals. So when somebody arrives at the emergency ward, someone triage person takes some notes, and that can all be electronically scanned. And so our colleagues at the health department are signing hospitals up and getting their um, their electronic records in real time, and they can see a wave of admissions for asthma coming across. That's what they're hoping, and they've actually demonstrated it last year. Um, there's been some encouraging modeling, um, although not, not that we're, we're doing it, but overseas. Um, and then on the health side, I won't say much about that because it's not, it's not my area. But um, I would say that the smartphone apps are pretty good. If you, if you or someone you know or someone in your family has got a concern about um, what you breathe, both the Melbourne Pollen and the Aerator apps um, give you a lot of really good information. So have a look at those. I'll just conclude with a few observations. Um, you know, as, as Faz already said, the importance of partnerships, you just can't do science 
or engineering these days um, in isolation you have to you know, to really do the top-notch stuff you need to be doing with experts from other fields or experts who bring their um, expertise to the table and here's our, our community of, of um, thunderstorms as the scientists didn't exist until 2016 but it's a very nice community um, collaborative right now um that it's it's not only necessary it's very rewarding i love multidisciplinary science and um it's, it's a little bit um challenging i suppose but you learn so much and you know they learn from what you know so it's, i would recommend it to anybody um early warnings have had a benefit um not just on Victorian. So I think um, it's raised the awareness in New South Wales and ACT, which is also susceptible to thunderstorm asthma. And um, yeah, it's, I, I think the awareness is, is at least as big a piece as having a warning, maybe big, maybe bigger. Um, and I'd just like to um, point out there's lots of opportunities for weather and climate to integrate with health. Um, and I've listed a few there, um, extreme heat, air quality, vector-borne diseases, mental health, but you could probably think of others as well. So I would love to see um, more multidisciplinary work sort of integrating weather and health. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Now there's the microphone. So Beth, thank you very much. Um, I know we all remember that day not very fondly. 10,000 people. Anyway, uh, comment or question from anyone here? At the back. Beth, you said that the, uh, the, the effect has been picked up in other states, but in fact, thunderstorms are there everywhere. Uh, the difference must mainly be in the pollens. What's special about Melbourne's pollen? It's a, it's a good question, Mike. Um, we believe that in Victoria, at least, ryegrass is um, the culprit that was responsible for most of the, um, you know, the serious health impacts. That's actually a cultivar, so it's a it's a fodder crop for cattle, and so possibly a choice could be made. Hasn't been made, but to not grow it, but it's, it's quite, you know, if you're a cattle farmer, it's uh, it's a nice thing to grow. Um, so there are C3 and C4 grasses. I don't, don't remember which are the subtropical and which are the, the temperate grasses, but um, that would that would certainly have to be a big part of it. Um, Melbourne is a hot spot. Well, southeastern Australia is a hot spot. Other hot spots are in the UK, Middle East, and it's probably not ryegrass there. Um, it would be birch pollen or other kinds of pollen. So it's not unique to ryegrass, but we do seem to have a lot of it uh, just in our area. I think Beth, there was also a question online, but which is on the same um, yeah. on the same lines. Is this a unique phenomenon to us in some way? But no. it sounds like it, it occurs in a lot of places. Anyway, we had a question here. Um, thanks, Beth. Um, I guess one of the rules about natural hazards is that they tend to impact the most vulnerable people in the community, um, and, and sometimes almost exclusively. And and we certainly saw that play out with with this event with. Um, um, the western suburbs and um, the migrant community being particularly badly affected. I think maybe all 10 deaths were in that kind of community. Or, or most close. of them, most of them. Yeah. yeah. From the multidisciplinary point of view, what, what did you or what did we learn from health about how to approach vulnerability to hazards? So certainly um, part of the response to this event was a lot of community education. And so the risk awareness um, piece didn't exist when this happened. People didn't know about thunderstorm asthma, mostly. Now, there were a few who did, and those were, tended to be people who had asthma, and they were already you know, protecting themselves pretty well. So a lot of the um, messaging and community education and risk awareness um, pieces that the department was working on were targeted um, to not just health um, practitioners, but to populations and put in a lot of different languages, a lot of um, very friendly, family-friendly videos that, short videos that you could watch and get some, some learning there. Um, so I think probably a lot of that work has been education. Um, I don't know so much on the, on the sort of response side of things, though, so yeah. 
Lucky Lives? Um, I thought it would be cool. About 10 years ago, Canova, we did work with uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers on heat waves uh, in mornings. And one of the biggest obstacles in that study was the inability to get hold of health data after the event and in real time was mainly the Privacy Act. And in Victoria and other states, that was perhaps the, the biggest obstacle to progress. I assume from what you said, perhaps some of that has improved? In a research sense. So yes, um, it has to be co-research done with the health. Uh, so, so we couldn't ask for the health data to be given to us. It, it needs to be done jointly. And that, in fact, in the new heat wave service that the Bureau is issuing, that was done jointly with um, the Commonwealth Department of Health. So it it is becoming easier. I think the methods of collecting and, and um, retrieving data have also become easier as well, but there's still a very um, reluctance to, to share those data out. So you do need to work with epidemiologists from the health department who, who do have access to those data. And you also need to um, be aware of the ethics around this as well. So, you know, as a Meteorologist ethics was never anything we needed to worry about. But when we started doing well, <laughs> sorry, maybe that came out wrong. <laughs> we needed to get ethics permission to do the research, and we went through the University of Melbourne to get that permission. And without that, we couldn't have published, we couldn't have done the work, which was interesting, and couldn't have used the health, the health data. Great, good recovery. Well, one more, I think. <laughs> Okay, uh, just a question on the dispersion model, which you seem to say that at the end, the machine learning techniques for doing a really better job. Um, what would you say, I'm not too familiar with the dispersion models and machine learning uh, in terms of quality, is it uh, generic? Is it something that we see in other dispersion problem or is something specific to this problem made of machine learning a better approach? I think the, the nature of the problem, we were trying, uh, the, the thing that we need to predict for the forecasting service is daily average pollen in a district. And so maybe a dispersion model is, is slightly overkill, but, but what by doing the machine learning, you were pretty much guaranteeing an unbiased forecast because you tuned it using data that, you know, real data. And the dispersion model was very hard to tune to get it right. You need to get the emission um, and the time of day. So what's causing the pollen to be released as well as how far will it travel? And, and a pollen grain actually doesn't travel very far. It's pretty heavy and it just usually drops. So unless it gets brought way up and, and it can travel further, you know, in, in loftier winds or else maybe it's already broken up and that lightweight stuff can travel a lot further, but we don't know the process as well enough to, to do it. And so the machine learning was just feeding Feeding the dispersion model. Did, did it have some input in terms of the geophysical parameter like winds or? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it does. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's wind, wind temperature, rain, um, humidity, and the previous um, pollen measurements is, is an input where it exists. So it's a continuously updating machine learning model. So it's quite good. All right, we might have to leave it there, unfortunately, Beth. We've run out of time. So thank you again. Go ahead. So I have now two small tasks to complete. The first is the commercial. So the, the next meeting will be the uh, annual meeting of the Victorian Division, and it's on the 7th of September, the, the usual time, 6.30 here. So we'll have the usual procedural stuff, but as we've done the last couple of years, one of, we've had a, uh, one of the leadership team from the Academy talk to us. So this time we have the new president, Catherine Woodbop has agreed to come and share some thoughts on the on the academy uh, at our annual meeting so i really hope you can uh, uh, you can make that and on the 12th of october we have again our joint meeting this year with the uh, royal society of victoria that's on stem education and it's at their place in latrobe street so that's the commercial uh, so the last thing is thank you for coming and please join me in thanking both of our speakers uh, once again great effort thank you very much